Welcome to Partner Technical Services product release training. The Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012 Financial Management New Features Accounts Payable course will be presented by Support Escalation Engineer Natalia Fernandez de la Garma and Senior Support Engineer Jeremy Tandeski. This course only covers new features, so knowledge of previous versions of Microsoft Dynamics AX is a prerequisite. This course was developed based on beta versions of Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012, so there may be some slight differences in the release product. Now let me introduce Natalia Fernandez de la Garma. Lesson 1, Payment Clearing. This lesson explains the setup needed to work with posting and definitions applied to payments and the payment clearing process. The post and definition affects the behavior of the bridging account functionality. When a payment instrument is issued, it is posted to either cash ledger account or clearing account that tracks all payments that are issued but not cleared by the bank. There can be a time lapse between the time that the payment is issued and when the money is actually transferred out of the bank account. The approach to record settlements against a clearing account more accurately reflects cash balances in bank accounts. This feature enables a user to generate more complex vouchers with additional entries. If you work with payment clearing and posting definition functionality, there are some setups that you have to consider. The first of them is the main account of the bank. You can see this information if you go to Cash and Bank Management module, Common, Bank Accounts, select the bank, edit, go to the Currency Management First tab, and there you will see the main account. This main account is important because it has to be considered in the post and definition setup and also because it's on this account where the bank transactions will be posted. Another important setup is the method of payment. In the method of payment is where you define the payment clearing functionality. This is not something new in Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012. And it works in the same way as it did in Microsoft Dynamics AX 2009. Something new is that you can access to this method of payment form from cash and bank management module, common bank account, select the bank, go to the action pane, click on setup, and there you will see the customer methods of payment and vendor methods of payment options. If you click on vendor methods of payment options, you will be able to see all the methods of payments that have been assigned to that specific bank account. In the methods of payment form, if you go to the general tab, you can see the fields that enable the bridging functionality that is what allows the payment clearing. Those important fields are firstly the account type. The account type is on which is the offset account type on which the transaction will be posted when the payment is definitely cleared by the bank. Normally, this account type will be the bank. Payment account is the payment account on which that transaction will be posted. Then, normally, you will define the bank account in, on which is going to be posted these kind of transactions. The bridging posting checkbox enables the bridging posting functionality. The bridging posting functionality is the one that allows you to work with payment clearing. The bridging account is the account on which initially the payments will be posted on. The last important setup is posting definitions. Posting definitions is a new feature that has been included in Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012. It extends posting profiles, serving as a more flexible and comprehensive approach to controlling ledger posting behavior. Posting profiles only supported one offset layer account, and posting definitions support more than one offset layer account for a given combination of attributes. It means that the information of your accounting books will be more accurate. It also provides the flexibility to generate multiple balanced layer entries based on input transaction attributes. Then, for example, before, when you posted a basic vendor payment journal, only two ledger entries were created, one for the main account of the vendor and other for the main account of the bank. 
Now you can add multiple entries to those entries. Posting definition also allows that the posting behavior is determined and based on transactions in the account and dimension values, allowing to create more complex transactions. Posting definitions provide mechanisms to define complex layer posting to provide the flexibility to meet different industry specific requirements. If you want to enable this functionality, you have to go to General Ledger, set up General Ledger parameters, Ledger accounting rules to use, and mark the Use Posting Definitions checkbox. If you don't mark it, then AX will work in the same way as it did in AX 2009. To set up posting definitions, you have to go to the posting definition form, that is, a set of rules defined to generate any number of balancing ledger entries. To access to this form, you have to go to General Layer, Setup, Posting, and Posting Definitions. If you want to create a new posting definition, then in the Posting Definition form, click on New. Enter a posting definition ID a description and also select the module for which you want to create the posting definition. In this case, it has to be bank. Also, you have to select the effective date from when the posting definition will be considered. The most important sections of this form are the match criteria and the generated entries. The match criteria is a full or partial account number that is compared to the originating entry account number. It also contains the dimension to match with dimensions on originated entry. If the match criteria is met, then entries for the generated account number that is selected in the generated entry section will be created. The sign of these generated entries will depend on the sign of the original entry and also on the, what you select in the field generated debit credit. If you select same, the generated entry will have the same sign as the originating entry. And if you select balancing, then the generated entry will have the opposite sign to the originating entry. If you want to work with posting definitions, you have to associate them to the payment journals. Then go to general layer, set up, posting, transaction post and definition form and then go to the bank tab. You also can access to this form going to General Ledger, Setup, Posting, Posting Definitions and then click on the Related Information button that is at the top of the form and then go to Bank tab. Here you have to select Vendor Payment Journal that is the journal for which you have created the posting definitions. Here, you can select if the posting definition is going to be applied to all the banks or only to some of them, and if it is going to be applied to all the methods of payment or only to some of them. Also, you have to enter the posting definition that is going to be considered in its register. Let's see how posting definition and payment clearing work when bridging account has been set up. Imagine the following scenario. The company is working with posting definition. Then you have to enable and set up the posting definition feature. Post an invoice. When you want to generate the payment for that invoice that has been already issued but it has not been cleared by the bank yet, then you have to create a payment journal with a method of payment that has the bridging posting functionality enabled and set up. The method of payment also has to be included in the transaction posting definition for the payment journal. This setup has been already explained. If you open the payment journal, you can see that the bridging account is working in the same way as it is in Microsoft Dynamics AX 2009. The offset account type is layer and the offset account is the bridging account. The difference is that the dimension of the bridging account is the one that has been set up in the posting definition form for the main account of the bank account. If you post the transaction, you can see that the first ledger entry is the one created for the vendor main account. The second ledger entry is the entry created for the bridging account plus the dimension that has been set up in the posting definition form for the main account of the bank account. And the third and fourth entries are the entries that were included 
in the generated entries section of the post and definition form. The only difference is that in the fourth one, in the post and definition form, the last dimension was blank. That's why it has been retrieved from the expense of the vendor invoice. Here, you also have a vendor transaction. And as you can see, there is not bank transaction because the payment has not been cleared by the bank. When the payment is cleared by the bank, you have to go to General Journal, click on Functions, then select Bid Transactions, select the transaction, click on Accept, and post the General Journal. If you check the voucher, you can see that the bridging account has been balanced and now it has been posted on the main account of the bank account. Now there is a bank transaction that has been posted. Let's see post and definition and payments when a bridging account has not been set up. Imagine the following scenario. The company is working with post and definition then you have to enable and set up the post and definition feature. Post an invoice. When you have done the payment, you have to create a new payment journal with a method of payment that does not have the bridging post and functionality enabled and that is included in the transaction post and definition form for the payment journal. Otherwise, the post and definition feature will not work in this journal. As you can see in the payment journal, the offset account type is bank and the offset account is the bank you have selected. Now it's working as a normal payment. Post the payment journal. In the first ledger entry, you can see the main account of the bank account plus the dimension that has been set up in the post and definition form for this main account of the bank. The second dimension comes from the vendor ledger account. The second ledger entry and the third ledger entry are those entries that were included in the generated entry se section of the post and definition form. In the same way as in the previous example, in the second ledger entry, the second dimension comes from the expense of the vendor invoice. This is because it was blank in the post and definition form. The fourth ledger entry is the vendor entry. As you can see, there is a vendor transaction because the vendor transaction has been settled. And also there is a bank transaction because the payment has been already cleared by the bank. In this recording, you have seen how the new feature of post and definition affects to the payments and especially to the payment clearing when a bridging account has been set up. Lesson 1, Postdated Checks. This lesson explains how to set up postdated checks and how to manage this new feature. The issuing and receipt postdated checks is common business practice in many parts of the world. Many businesses use checks as the primary means of making and receiving payments. The postdated checks functionality is available on both the account receivable and account payable modules. This feature is fully integrated with dimensions, centralized payments, settlements, and the standard banking functionality available in Microsoft Dynamics AX. If you want to work with postdated checks, you have to enable this functionality in General Layer Setup General Layer Parameters Postdated Checks. In this form, you will find the following options. Enable postdated checks. If you mark this checkbox, you will enable the postdated check functionality, otherwise you will not be able to work with postdated checks. Post journal entries for postdated checks. Financial entries related with postdated checks will be posted. If you don't mark this checkbox, there will not be financial entries for the postdated check transactions. Create an account for issued checks. This is the ledger account that defaults to the vendor methods of payment that enable postdated check functionality. It has the same functionality as the bridging account, but this is for vendor methods of payments that have the postdated 
functionality enabled. Clear an account for received checks. This is the ledger account that defaults to the customer methods of payment that enable post-dated check functionality. It also has the same functionality as the bridging account, but this is for customer methods of payment that have enabled the post-dated check functionality. General journal for clearing entries. When clearing a post-dated check, an automatic transaction will be posted on this journal. Transfer post-dated checks to this payment vendor journal. This is the default journal to transfer the post-dated checks from the post-dated check register to the payment journal. Withholding tax clearing account. This is the clearing account that will be used in case that the company was with withholding tax. Once you have enabled the post-dated check functionality from the general ledger parameters, you have to set up the method of payment. The setup of the method of payment for post-dated checks is very similar to the bridging account functionality. This is because both features have the same purpose. I mean, when you issue a post-dated check, you want to settle the vendor transaction, but the money has not been transferred out of the bank account, then you don't want to create the bank transaction till the money has been created by the bank. To set up the method of payment, you can go to Cash and Bank Management, come on Bank Account, select the bank, go to the setup action from the action PIM, and then you will find the customer method of payment and the vendor method of payment. If you click on the vendor method of payment, you will see a list of methods of payment that has been assigned to this bank account. This is a new path that has been created in Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012. You also can access to this form from account payable, setup, payments, methods of payments. That is the same way as in Microsoft Dynamics AX 2009. Let's say the most important fields for post-dated check functionality in this form. You have to select the account type for which you are defining the method of payment. This will be the offset account type on which the clearing transaction will be posted. When working with post-dated check functionality, the account type is bank. Payment account. This is the account on which the bank transactions will be posted when the bridging account is created. You have to select the bank account you are working with post-dated check. Post-dated check clearing posting. It enables the post-dated check functionality at methods of payment level. Bridging account. This is the account on which initially the payments done with this method of payment will be posted. Later, when the payment is cleared by the bank, you will post the bank transaction and this bridging account will be balanced. Let's see the process for recording post-dated checks. Firstly, you have to enable and set up the post-dated check functionality. You have to do it from the general ledger parameters and also in the method of payments. This setup has been already explained. Post an invoice. You can post an invoice, but this is not needed to create a post-dated check. You also can do it directly from the payment journal. But you have to select a method of payment that has enabled the post-dated check functionality. In the payment journal, once you select the right method of payment, a new tab will appear. The new tab is called post-dated check. Let's go to the post-dated check tab. This tab has some fields that are related to the post-dated checks. Let's see all these fields one by one. Maturity date. This is the date from which the check is valid for encashment. Receive date. This is the date when the post-dated check has been received. Post-dated check status. This field is not editable and informs about the post-dated check status. Check numbers. This number defaults when you generate the post-dated check, although you also can fill in it manually. Cashier, the employee in charge of this cash transaction. Salesperson, the employee responsible of the sales transaction. Stop payment. The payment can be on hold 
and voice the check for further use. Reason for stopping payment. You can add reasons why the payment has been stopped. Replacement check. You can only replace cancelled checks. Comments. You can add comments about why you have replaced a check. Original check. This is the original check that has been replaced. Currency. This is the currency in which the check has been generated. Amount is the check amount. Issuing bank branch is the branch of the bank issuing the check. Issuing bank name is the name of the bank issuing the check. Once you have filled in all the required information in the payment journal and also in the post-dated check tab, then you can generate the payment. To generate the payment, you can do it in the same way as you did in Microsoft Dynamics AX 2009. Then go to Functions, Generate Payment, select the method of payment and click OK. Once you have generated the payment, the status of the line will change to Send and you can post the uh, payment journal. Once you have registered the post-dated check, you can manage it from Account Payable, Common, Post-dated Checks and Vendor Post-dated Checks. This is a new pane that has been created in Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012 to manage post-dated checks titling from here. In this pane, you have the following options. Checks to send to the bank. In this form, you can see the checks which maturity day is on or before the system date. It will allow you to control the post-dated checks. The settled clearing entries. If you select a post-dated check and you click on Settle Clearing Entries, the clearing transaction will be posted directly. We will see this feature later in more detail. If you select a post-dated check and click on View Settlement Information, you can see the information of the invoice or the vendor transaction that has been settled with this post-dated check. Cancel post-dated checks. If you select a post-dated check and click on cancel post-dated checks, you can cancel them directly from here. We will see this functionality later in more detail. Lesson 7 describes the purchase order year-end process in Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012. To properly track encumbrances by fiscal year, organizations that encumber purchase orders must generate year-end closing transactions to the general ledger and against budget reserves at the end of the fiscal year. At the beginning of the new fiscal year, a new set of adjusting entries are made to correctly reflect the encumbrances in the new fiscal year. These sets of transactions ensure that the purchase orders are correctly represented, correctly represented on the year-end financial statements. Depending on specific accounting rules governing the organization and the individual management preferences of the organization, Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012 provides two different options to meet these needs. The choices for processing purchase orders at year end are to process and do not carry forward budget or process and carry forward budget. The results of each of these choices will be discussed a little later in this lesson. In addition to the normal setup that would be required to encumber purchase orders, which involves the budget control setup for purchase order source documents and also selecting the general ledger parameter to allow for the encumbrance of purchase orders. There is also some necessary setup on the posting definitions and transaction posting definitions forms in order to use the year-end purchase order process. Let's take a look at those forms to see the proper setup. To navigate to the transaction posting definitions form, Go to the General Ledger module in the Setup area, select Posting and Transaction Posting Definitions. On the Purchasing tab, select the Purchase Order Year End Close option and ensure that a posting definition has been selected for the Purchase Order Year End Close transactions. And close the form. Open the Posting Definitions form. Select the posting definition that was specified for year-end close on the transaction posting definitions form and review the match criteria and the generated entries 
that will be created during the purchase order year end close process to ensure they are correct. If they are correct, close the form. To perform the purchase order year end process, go to the periodic area in General Ledger, select fiscal year close, and select purchase order year end process. Before performing the purchase order year end process, users will want to cancel or close out any remaining purchase orders or purchase order lines that will not be carried forward to the new year. On the form, select the year end option to use, either process and carry forward or process and do not carry forward the budget. If the process and carry forward budget option is selected, the budget transaction code fields will become available for use. In the original budget transaction code field, select a budget transaction code that will be used for budget adjustment transactions made in the closing fiscal year. In the carry forward budget transaction code field, select a budget transaction code for budget adjustment transactions made in the new fiscal year. If only one valid budget transaction code exists for the transaction types, the code will default. If the process and do not carry forward option is selected, these fields are not editable. Additional fields that are available on the purchase order year end processing form are the calendar, which will default to the legal entity's fiscal calendar, the fiscal year, where you can select the fiscal year to be closed, the accounting date associated with the closing transactions, the period type associated with the closing transactions, and you can select either an operating or a closing period. If you select a closing period, you can select the closing fiscal period from the dropdown. Also, the accounting date associated with the opening transactions and the period associated with the opening transactions. Select the Retrieve Purchase Orders button to create a query to either select all purchase orders or a subset of the open purchase orders. Use the criteria field to limit the process to a manageable set of purchase orders. Then click OK to run the process and populate the form with open purchase orders. Mark the include box to include the purchase order in the year end purchase order process. Use the Include All button to check all purchase orders, or use the Exclude All button to exclude all purchase orders. Use the View Purchase Order command to view a selected purchase order. You may also select a specific purchase order and click View Subledger Journal to view the Subledger Journal entry form. Finally, mark the purchase orders you want to include in the purchase order year end process and click process to run the purchase order year end close. Click OK when asked to confirm. When the process is complete, you will get a message saying the year end process has finished. The results of the process can be viewed in the info log. Purchase orders that resulted in errors must be processed again. Click OK and you'll get a confirmation again in the info log of the purchase orders that were processed successfully. Now that you've seen a brief demonstration on the purchase order year end process, let's discuss what happens for each budget option. When selecting the process and do not carry forward budget option, in the closing fiscal year, remaining encumbrances in the general ledger and outstanding budget reservations for encumbrances are reversed. Year end closing transactions are generated in the general ledger utilizing the purchase order year end transaction posting definition. In the opening or new fiscal year, closing transactions are reversed. Encumbrances are reestablished in the general ledger utilizing the purchase order transaction posting definition, and budget reservations for encumbrances are created for the purchase orders that are being processed against the new year's budget. When the process and carry forward budget option is selected in the closing fiscal year, remaining encumbrances in the general ledger and outstanding budget reservations for encumbrances are reversed. 
Year-end closing transactions are generated in the general ledger utilizing the purchase order year-end transaction posting definition. And budget adjustments are created to reduce the budget in the fiscal year that is being closed. In the opening or new fiscal year, closing transactions are reversed. Encumbrances are re-established in the general ledger, again, utilizing the purchase order transaction posting definition. Budget reservations for encumbrances are created for the purchase orders that are being processed and classified as carry forward encumbrances. And budget adjustments are created in the new fiscal year to re-establish the budget register entries that were carried forward from the previous fiscal year and classified as carry forward budget. That concludes the presentation of this module for new features in financials management for Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012. Hello, this is Jeremy Tandeski, a senior support engineer with Microsoft Dynamics AX support. Today, we're gonna to take a look at Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012, some financial new features, accounts receivable and accounts payable settlements. In this module, we're gonna learn some of the new functionality surrounding accounts receivable and accounts payable settlements and cash discounts. The first lesson, new parameters and fields. In this lesson, we're going to explain the new parameters that were introduced with accounts receivable and accounts payable settlements and cash discounts. Although this is a feature to Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012, this was also backported to Microsoft Dynamics AX 2009 Service Pack 1 Rollup 5. There's two new parameters that we'll see. One is calculate cash discounts for partial payments. In previous versions of Dynamics AX, you would take a cash discount only when the invoice was fully paid or fully settled. Now you are able to take a partial discount when the invoice is partially paid. There's also an option to calculate cash discounts for credit notes. You can take a discount or reduce the amount that a credit note is worth when applied to an invoice. The open transaction and editing form also has new fields, settlement posting date, and date used for calculating cash discounts. We'll see those as we go through the demo and look at some transactions. If we look in Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012, in Accounts Payable, Setup, Accounts Payable Parameters. Here on the Settlement tab, you'll see the two new parameters, Calculate Cash Discounts for Partial Payments and Calculate Cash Discounts for Credit Notes. Likewise, on the Accounts Receivable side, if we go to Accounts Receivable, Setup, Accounts Receivable Parameters, and choose the Settlement option. Here we will see our two new parameters, Calculate Cash Discounts for Partial Payments, and Calculate Cash Discounts for Credit Notes. Lesson 2 is Partial Discount Calculation. In Lesson 2, we'll learn how discounts are calculated when doing partial settlements. Consider this example. We offer a 1% discount we have an invoice for $1,000. When this invoice is fully settled, there will be $10 total discount, assuming that it is settled within the cash discount period. If we want to pay half of the invoice, so we're going to pay $500, we'll take the amount of the payment divided by the amount of the invoice that we're going to be paying times the discount amount. For example, if a customer submits, remits a $500 payment, we divide that by 99 or 0.99, 99% to get $505.05. That calculation alone will give us the total payment, our $500 and a $5.05 discount. To find the discount amount, we take that times 1%, which is our discount amount, and we get $5.05. So a $5.05 discount plus our initial $500 payment will result in a $505.05 settlement. If we want to pay exactly half, including the discount, the customer can remit $495. If we use that value in our calculation, $495 divided by our 99% that we are paying equals $500. That is our total payment. If we multiply that times our 1% discount, we see a $5 discount. So that would result in a $495 settlement 
a $5 discount and a total settlement of $500. Lesson three is settlement and discount examples. In this lesson, we're gonna go through some examples of settlements and discount calculations. We'll take a look at partial settlements. We'll show a discount on credit note. And we'll also show tiered discounts. For this example, I'm gonna create a new customer. This customer will then not have any history. So we'll create customer 902307. Add that customer to customer group 10. I'm going to then save and open the customer form. When I save and open this form, by default, I'm in view mode. Here I can see some details on this customer. In order to edit this customer, I need to click the pencil icon at the bottom of the form or the edit button at the top of the form. By clicking that button, I can now click on the different fast tabs and edit details. If I look at payment defaults, I can see that the terms of payment for this customer are net 30. I'm gonna also add a cash discount of 1% in 10 days. So we're gonna offer this customer a 1% discount if paid in 10 days. Close and save this form. What we'll then do is we will add a free text invoice for this customer. So we will create a new free text invoice. For customer 902307. And to keep our date simple, we'll choose the first of the month. Invoice number one. We choose our account. And this invoice is for $1,000. By clicking the totals button at the top of the form, I can see the totals. It's a $1,000 invoice. There are no discounts, no total discounts, no uh, sales tax. We have an invoice amount of 1,000 and a cash discount available of $10. Close the totals form. And what we'll now do is we'll post this invoice by clicking the post button at the top of the form. Once that's posted, we'll very quickly go to this customer. So if I go back to the area page, and click on all customers. And here we have our customer 902307. I can click on my transactions button at the top of the form, and I can see that there's an invoice for $1,000. To pay this invoice, there's a few ways that I can do this. Back to my area page, if I go in the journal section to payments, payment journal, Here I create a new payment journal. And I can click the enter customer payments option at the top of the form. The invoice was dated 6-1 with a 1% discount in 10 days. So if I pay it on 6-7, I'm within that discount period. So I'll choose my customer. When I choose my customer, I'll see my transactions appear at the bottom of the form. Going back to the example that we had in the slides, if this customer remits a payment of $500, and I mark the invoice, expand this form so we can see more of it. By default, you'll see the amount to pay will show the total. So it was a $1,000 invoice with a 1% cash discount or $10. So the amount to pay by default shows $990. As the customer is remitting 500, we change the amount to pay to show 500. When I tab off, 
we can see that the discount amount to take then updates to $5.05. Again, if we wanted to settle with the payment including the discount of an even 500, we can change this to $495 payment. And when I tab off and I mark the amount to pay on this invoice of $495, the discount amount to take updates to $5. I can then click Save and Journal, close the form, and I've got my journal. If I want to verify, I can look at the lines. I see I have a payment of $495. I'm going to go ahead and post this. And once posted, we'll take a look at this customer's transactions. So if I go back to my all customers, and 902307, if I click on transactions, here I can see that I have a $1,000 invoice. It has a $500 balance. I've settled for, I've, I have a $495 payment, a $5 cash discount. So I've settled a total of $500. If we then want to pay the second half, the remainder of this invoice, I'll again go back to my payment journal. I'll create a new payment journal. And this time, instead of clicking enter customer payments, I'm going to click the lines option. And we will say that on 6-9, so two days later, we're going to pay the remainder. I'll choose my customer account. From here, what I'll then do is click on Functions, Settlement. This will take me into the Settle Open Transactions form. Here I can see the open transactions for this customer. I see that I've got an invoice dated 6-1. The amount remaining is $500. The amount to settle is $495. The reason it's $495 is that my payment date is within the cash discount period. There's a $500 amount remaining on this invoice, but there's also a $5 discount eligible. If we look at the bottom left of the form, we can see the discount on this invoice is $10. The discount taken is $5. And the discount amount to take is also $5. If I mark the invoice to pay the remainder, I'll close the form. A payment is created for me for $495. I'll then post this payment. And we'll go take a look at this customer's transactions. We click the Transactions button. Here we see we have our $1,000 invoice. We have our first payment on 6-7 for $4.95. My cash discount for $5 that relates to the first payment. We have our second payment on 6-9 for $495. And we have our second cash discount of $5 that relates to the second payment on 6-9. Another example that I'd like to show We'll create a new customer. Nine oh two three zero eight. We'll create this customer with the same information, so it belongs to customer group ten. We'll quickly save and open this customer form. We'll edit this form, edit the customer record. And we'll give this customer a cash discount of 1% in 10 days. We'll go back to our area page and we'll go to free text invoices. We'll create a new free text invoice for 902-308 using the same date of 6-1.
and this invoice will be again for a thousand dollars. I'll go ahead and post my invoice. Now what I want to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to go back to the area page. I'm going to create a payment journal for this customer. And in the last example, we settled this payment to an invoice. Instead of settling it to an invoice, what I'll do is just create and post the payment. So the payment is not yet settled to an invoice. By default, my date is today's date, 4067. Choose the customer, 902308. We'll do a payment of $495 because we know that we're going to take a $5 discount to settle a total of $500. But instead of settling it, I'm just going to post this payment. Once posted, now let's take a look at this customer's transactions. In looking at this customer's transactions, here we can see we have an invoice for a thousand with a balance of a thousand, a payment of four ninety five, and a balance of four ninety five. So nothing has been settled. I'll close this form, and on this customer, I'm going to go to the Collect tab. Settle open transactions. So this again takes me into the open transaction editing form. Here I can see my open invoice and my open payment. I'll mark the invoice and the payment to settle to one another. Again, by default, we see that the invoice shows $1,000 and we're going to settle $990 by default because we have a $10 discount available. Our payment, however, is for $495. So we're going to update this to show $495 that we are settling with this transaction. By doing that, we see at the bottom of the form, the total discount is $10. The discount amount to take shows $5. We, earlier, we talked about a couple new fields as well. Here in this form, you'll see that there's a settlement posting date. So we can choose uh, the date that we're going to use to settle these transactions. We can also choose the date used for calculating cash discounts. Typically it would be tra uh, the transaction date, but we can also choose selected date and manually enter a date. So for example, if our, if our payment was outside of the discount period, but we wanted to settle it using uh, and take the discount, we could enter a date. What I'll do is I'll keep this set to transaction date as it defaulted, and then we'll post the second payment using a different date. So with these two transactions marked, the appropriate amount entered in the amount to settle field, in the upper left corner of this form, I will click the update button, and it'll update and settle those two transactions to one another. Now you'll see I've got my invoice for $1,000 with $500 remaining, and $495 amount to settle if we pay that within the discount period. Now what I'm going to do is go back to the area page, Go back to the journal section and create another payment journal. I'm going to go to lines. And on this payment, I'm going to enter the date of 615. 902308 is my customer. And we're going to enter an amount of $495. This payment's going to be after the discount period. So in theory, we should be paying $500. But if the customer remits of an amount of $495, I'm gonna post this payment. Again, I'm not settling it to anything at this point. And if I go back to the customer form, I'll choose my customer and we can see our transactions. So I've got my initial invoice of 1,000, a balance of 500, I've got my first payment of 495. We took a discount of five. And now I've got an open payment of $495, and it still has the remainder of uh, the remaining balance of $495. I'm going to close this form, and we're going to click the collect tab and settle open transactions. Here I'm going to mark my invoice. I'm going to mark my payment. Here you can see that 
the amount on the invoice shows $500. It shows that we're going to settle $495, and that's the amount of my payment. But you'll notice the customer still has a balance of $5. The reason for that is that this payment is outside of the discount date of 610. You'll also notice on the bottom, because this is after the discount date, my discount amount and discount amount to take show zero. The second example I want to show you is I'm going to create a new customer. And this customer will be 902309. We'll give this customer the same customer group, 10, as our previous customer. I'm going to save and open this customer. And we'll edit this for this customer record. And this customer also has terms of payment net 30 and a cash discount of 1% in 10 days. Close this form. And I'm going to enter a new free text invoice. This is for customer 902309. And we'll use the first of the month. And this invoice will be for $1,000. Let's go ahead and post that invoice. Now what we're going to do is we're going to create a payment journal. So in the journals, payments, payment journal, we'll create a new payment journal for our customer 902309 on 6-7. We'll create this for $495 because we know that if we pay half or we pay $495 and take a half of our $10 discount or $5, we'll have a total settlement of $500. In our last example, we marked the, this payment to the invoice, settled them, and updated and posted the transactions. Instead of settling it right now, what I'm going to do is just post this payment. Now that it's posted, we'll go take a look at this customer record. So 902309, and if we look at the transactions, here we have an open invoice for $1,000 with a balance of $1,000. We've got a payment for $495 and the full balance of $495. It hasn't been applied or settled to anything. If I close this form and I click the Collect tab, here I'll click Settle Open Transactions. Here I can mark my invoice and my payment. You'll notice the invoice shows $1,000. And by default, the amount to settle will show us $990. This is our $1,000 less our $10 discount because we are in our discount period as of 6-7. This payment is only $495. So I'm going to enter $495 as the amount to settle. You'll notice on the bottom left of the form, we see our discount is $10, and our discount amount to take is $5, or half of our discount. We're going to go ahead, and in the upper left-hand corner, we'll click Update to settle the payment to the invoice. Now you'll see we have the invoice of $500 remaining, and the amount to settle is $495. We took in the bottom left corner, you'll see we've taken a discount of $5. The total was 10, and we have a discount amount to take remaining of 5. What we'll now do is change our system date to a date that's after the discount period. So we'll say the 15th. We're going to go back and create another payment for this customer. So we'll create a new payment journal. Click on the lines. So on 615. And we'll say they sent us another $495. So we're after the discount period. But they remitted $495 and believe that they're going to take another $5 discount. So what I'm going to do is post this payment. Again, we have not settled this payment to an invoice. We'll go and verify that by looking at the customer. And on the transactions, 
Here we see we have our $1,000 invoice. It's got a $500 balance. We've got a $495 payment, a $5 discount. These have a $0 balance. And our last payment of $495 has a balance of $495 remaining. I close this form and we click the Collect tab, Settle Open Transactions. Here you'll notice with our invoice selected, we've got $500 and a $500 amount to settle. Where before the amount to settle was showing the full amount minus the cash discount. If we look in the bottom left corner, we see the discount taken is $5, but the discount amount is zero and there's zero dollar discount to take because we are again after that discount period. In order to see this information, we must be sure that at the top of the form we're highlighted on our invoice. What I'm going to do is mark my invoice and mark my payment to settle to one another. If I settle this and I click the update at this time, this invoice will have $5 remaining to be paid. A couple of things that I can do is if we're going to allow the customer just to take this discount, in the bottom left, I can change this use cash discount and change it from normal to always. With my invoice selected, here you can see that the customer has a $5 balance remaining. In the bottom left corner, the discount taken shows five. The discount amount shows zero and the amount to take shows zero because we're after our discount period. With the invoice highlighted, if I set this to always because we're gonna let them take that $5 discount, they remitted $495 less our $5 discount and we're gonna okay that for them to take it. By changing that to always, now we can see our discount amount here shows 10. It shows that we've taken five and the amount that we're about to take on this transaction is five as well. The amount to settle in the upper right hand corner shows $495. What I'm going to do is set this back to normal. You'll see it's again going to go back to our $500 and we're not going to take a discount here. We talked about a couple other fields earlier. There's a date to use for calculating discounts. By default, this will be set to transaction date. Another option I can do is choose selected date. By choosing selected date, it'll default with today's date. But let's say we change that to the seventh, which is within our discount period. Here again, you'll see that our transaction now shows 495 to settle. Again, we're highlighted on the invoice record. In the bottom left-hand corner, we have a discount amount of 10. We've taken five and we're going to take five again. I can go ahead and click update. And now my transactions are removed from this form. If I close that form and go back to the customer tab and click on transactions, you can see that I've got two payments for $495. And I did take two discounts on each, uh, a discount on each for five or a total of $10 discount. So you can see that there's a couple ways that we can take a discount even after the discount period. One is by setting that use discount to always, or we can use that selected date to calculate our cash discounts. Another example I'd like to show is we'll create a new customer, 902310. This customer is going to belong to the same customer group. I'm going to save and open the form because we've got, an ad, we've got to add a cash discount to this customer. So we're going to add 1% in 10 days. I'm going to close the customer form. We're going to go ahead and enter a free text invoice for this customer. Just like we've done in the previous examples, So on 6-1, we're going to enter a $1,000 invoice. I'm going to go ahead and post. I'll post this invoice. And what we're going to also do is we're going to create a credit. So for 902, 
310, and we'll use 61. We'll call this credit one. So we'll create a credit for $200. I'm going to go ahead and post that. Close these forms. What I also need to do is under accounts receivable, set up accounts receivable parameters. Under my settlement tab, we're going to verify, which it wasn't marked, we're going to mark calculate cash discounts for credit notes. I then go back to this customer. I'll click on transactions. I can see I've got a $1,000 invoice and a $200 credit. If I go into the collect tab and we're going to settle our credit to our invoice, I'll mark my invoice, mark my credit note. All right, starting that last example over again. Another example that I'd like to go through is calculating cash discounts on credit notes. If we go back to our area page to set up accounts receivable parameters, in the settlement option, we talked about calculating cash discounts for credit notes. We're going to mark that option. And we're going to also go to set our, set our system date back to today's date. I'm going to create a new customer. So this is customer. 902311. This customer belongs to customer group 10, and we're going to save and open the customer form and click edit mode so we can add a cash discount of 1% in 10 days. We'll close the form. And then I will then go and enter a free text invoice. Four nine zero two three one one, and we'll use six one. We'll enter an invoice for thousand dollars, and we'll go ahead and post this invoice. What I'm going to also do is enter a credit of two hundred dollars. So for customer nine zero two three eleven. And we'll do that as well on 6-1. And we'll enter it for the amount of $200 or negative 200. Go ahead and post this. If I go back to my customer form, And we look at customer 902311 and click on transactions. Here we can see they're not settled against one another. We have an amount, an invoice for 1000 and a credit for 200 I can now click on the collect tab and back where we were before and settle open transactions. Here I can mark my invoice, mark my credit. Here we'll see that the amount to settle for the credit is $198. This is a $200 credit note. We have 1% discount. So we're taking a $2 discount on this credit note. We're going to then settle 198 of that to our invoice. And you'll see with the invoice highlighted, we've got a total discount amount of 10. We haven't taken anything yet, but, but by settling 198, we're going to take a $2 discount on the invoice as well. If I go ahead and click update, you can see I've got an invoice with $800 remaining. So $200 is settled. We'll go ahead and close this form. Go back to the customer tab. Click on transactions. And here we can see we've got our $1,000 invoice, a balance of $800. We've got our $200 credit. Here we've got our discount. And this discount applies to 10033, which is our invoice. And the bottom discount applies to our credit note of 100001. So by marking that calculate 
cash discounts on credit note option, we entered a $200 credit note, but we took a 1% discount on that credit note. By settling that to our invoice, we actually settled $198 of this $1,000 invoice, which took also a $2 discount, which leaves us with the remaining balance of $800. The final option I'd like to show is tiered discounts. If I go back to the area page, if we go into accounts receivable, setup, payment, cash discounts. What I've done is I've set up a discount of 5% if paid in 10 days. If we look over on the next discount code, we see 1% in 20 days. So here, if they pay it in 10 days, we're going to offer a 5% discount. And then from days 11 through 20, or if they pay it in that second tier, they'll get a 1% discount. I'm going to go ahead and close this form. We create a new customer. Nine oh two three one two. I'm going to open so I can edit this customer record. And on this customer record, we're going to set the cash discount of five percent in ten days. And again, this had a tiered discount of one percent in twenty days. So we'll go ahead and close this record we'll go back and I'm going to enter a free text invoice and we'll enter this on 6-1 we'll enter our same invoice for thousand dollars and I'm going to post this invoice I'm going to go back and create a payment journal. The payment journal will be for the same customer. Click on lines and we'll enter the first payment on 6-7. So we are within the first discount period, which is a 5% discount, which is a total of $50. I'm going to enter my customer and I'm going to click on functions. Settlement. I'm going to create a payment that's going to be settled to this invoice. And notice if I if I leave this and don't change anything, I'll be creating a $950 payment. In the bottom left, we can see that the discount amount to take is $50, and the discount amount I would be taking here is $50. Instead, we're going to pay half, so we're going to take a $25 discount which is going to result in an amount to settle of 475, oops, excuse me, $475. By doing that, in the bottom left, we'll see that the discount amount to take is updated to $25. I'll go ahead and close this form. I've got a payment of $475, and I'm going to go ahead and post that payment. Once posted, let's go ahead and just take a look at this customer's transaction. So here we can see we've got a $1,000 invoice. It's got a balance of $500. The reason is we took a $475 payment and we paid it within the first discount period, which was a 5% discount. So we took a $25 discount. That first discount period was 10 days. So now what I'm going to do is we'll go ahead and change our our date to 617 so we're in the second discount period of 1%. I'll go back to payment journal, create a new payment journal and we'll choose on 617 we'll choose our customer and I'm going to click function settlement. Here when I mark this we'll see it's $495 here we can see the discount taken is $25. Now the discount amount shows $10 because we're in the second discount period. The second discount period was 1% and 1% of our $1,000 invoice is $10. So if this 
invoice was fully settled in this second period, we would take a $10 discount. But because we're settling half of that, or $495, we'll be taking half of that eligible $10 discount, or $5. You can also click the cash discount tab up here, and we can see our cash discount periods. We can see that if settled by 611, the discount was 50. If settled by 621, the discount was 10 or 1%. And the net is due by 71, which is no discount on the total amount remaining of 500. So I'm going to go ahead with this mark and I'm going to close this form, which will create a payment amount of $495. I'll go ahead and post this payment. And once posted, we'll go ahead and look at our customer transactions. So here we've got a $1,000 invoice. It, the balance remaining is zero. A $475 payment, a $25 discount that was taken, also a $495 payment with a $5 discount. When we total these up, we should get our thousand. If we remember from the example, the total discount available was 5% if paid within the first discount period, or $50. And we took 25 plus 5 or $30 worth of that $50 discount because we paid it the first discount period and partially in the second discount period. And with that example, that'll conclude today's demo. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to view today's training on AX. 2012 What's New, Accounts Receivable and Accounts Payable Settlements and Cash Discounts. Thank you. Hi, this is Jeremy Tandeski, a Senior Support Engineer with the Microsoft Dynamics AX Support Team. Today we're going to be looking at Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012 Financials New Features Vendor Prepayments. In the first module, we're going to take a look at vendor prepayments in Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012. The first lesson we're going to take a look at is setup. This lesson will explain the necessary setup for vendor prepayments. There are two main setups we want to take a look at. One is the posting profile for prepayments, and number two is the posting accounts. If we take a look in Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012, the first place to take a look at is the posting profile. So if we go to Accounts Payable, Setup, Vendor Posting Profiles. Here we can set up a posting profile of prepayment where we can specify our accounts that will, be, that will be used. Once those are set up, if we look in the Accounts Payable Parameters, on the Ledger and Sales Tax tab, here we have a posting profile to be used with prepayment transactions. Here's where we'll enter that prepayment posting profile that we just created. Another location for accounts is under Inventory and Warehouse Management. In, in the Inventory and Warehouse Management module, if we go to Setup, and choose Posting, Posting. Here, when we click the Purchase Order tab, we'll have a prepayment option. We'll need to make sure that we have at least one prepayment account set up here. We typically recommend the item code relation of all to be used as a catch-all. The prepayment is going to be posted based on a procurement category, so you can also set up accounts for specific category relationships. In the second lesson, we'll look at creating a prepayment. A few steps that will be involved with creating a prepayment. One is it's created from a purchase tab on the purchase order. We can enter a prepayment by amount or percent, and we must confirm the purchase order. If we go to the procurement and sourcing module, here's where we'll see our purchase orders. So here under common, purchase orders, all purchase orders, we're going to create a new purchase order. Here I'm going to choose vendor account 1001 and transfer the information for this vendor.
what I'm going to do on this purchase order is I'm going to enter an item. And we're purchasing item number 1000, an LCD television. We're going to purchase 20 of them, and they each cost $1,500. The total on the invoice is $30,000. Before this vendor will ship the goods, we must, they're requiring that we pay a prepayment. So until they receive that prepayment, they won't release the goods. On the purchase order, if we click the purchase tab, here we see our prepayment section. By clicking the prepayment option, here's where we have our couple options. We can enter our description and we can enter a fixed amount or a percent. In this case, the vendor said, we need 20% of this before we'll, we'll release the goods. So entering 20%, Dynamics AX will figure out that this is 20% of 30,000 or $6,000. So it's gonna create a $6,000 prepayment transaction. Again, we need to enter a prepayment category ID and we're going to choose video and this was a television and we'll click save so once we've entered the information on our purchase order we've got our quantity our unit price and our total we've created the prepayment we now need to confirm the purchase order lesson three is invoicing and paying the prepayment in this lesson, we'll learn how to invoice and pay this prepayment transaction. What we'll need to do is go to the invoice tab on the purchase order. We'll click to invoice and we'll get a message that says a prepayment amount is available for this purchase order. Do you want to create a prepayment invoice? We're going to create, choose yes, and we'll pay this prepayment invoice through the standard payment journal. Once this prepayment has been paid and the vendor receives that payment, now they'll ship the goods. So this invoice has been confirmed. We'll click on the invoice tab and the invoice button. We'll get the message that says a prepayment amount is available for this purchase order. Would you like to create a prepayment invoice? We'll choose yes. Here we must make sure to enter an invoice number. We'll see that we have our procurement category Quantity of one for 6,000. Notice it doesn't have our item number. This is again our prepayment invoice. So once the invoice number is entered, we can go ahead and post this invoice. So once our invoice comes up, we can see that this is for $6,000, which was our 20% of our total invoice amount. We'll go ahead and close that. And what we'll do is I'd like to go back to the vendor transactions. So if we go into accounts payable and we choose our vendor and it was vendor 1001 and click on transactions button. Here we can see that there's an invoice for $6,000. This is our prepayment invoice. And again, we pay this through the normal payment journal process. So if we go to Accounts Payable, and in the Journal section, Payments, Payment Journal. Here we're going to create a new payment journal. And on the lines, here I'll choose my account 1001. And we'll go to Functions, Settlement. And I'll be seeing this vendor's open transactions. So here we can see our invoice number one for $6,000. We're going to mark that to settle. Close the form and now we have a payment for $6,000. We'll generate our payment. So here we've got our check for $6,000 that we send to the vendor. And we can go ahead and post our payment journal. Once that's posted, 
So once that invoice has been paid, the vendor receives the payment, and now we're ready to complete the purchase order. They'll, they'll send the goods and invoice the purchase order. The next lesson is completing the purchase order. In this lesson, we'll invoice the purchase order. On the Vendor Invoice tab, we're going to first click Apply Prepayment to apply the prepayment that we've already paid. We'll choose the prepayment that we want to apply. An invoice will be created for the difference, so for the invoice amount, less the prepayment that we've already paid, and then we'll pay that through a standard payment journal as well. In Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012, we'll go back to the Procurement and Sourcing module. We'll click on All Purchase Orders. Here we'll find the purchase order that we were working with, and we'll click the Edit tab. This will bring us into that purchase order. On this purchase order, we'll click the Invoice tab, and we're going to click to invoice this purchase order. Here we'll also need to enter our invoice number. Notice we're not prompted for anything having to do with the prepayment, but you'll notice also at the top there's an Apply Prepayment option. What we'll do is we'll click Apply Prepayment, and here we can see the invoice that we're in the purchase order that we're going to apply it to. And here is our invoice number one for $6,000 that we've already invoiced and paid. We'll select that. We'll click Apply Prepayment. Now we've got our $30,000 invoice line for our item 1,000. We've also got a line that's going to hit our procurement category for our 20% or our $6,000 prepayment. We're going to go ahead and post this invoice. Once this invoice comes up, we can see that it's a $30,000 invoice. We'll go ahead and close this. And we're going to go look at an accounts payable, vendors, and we'll choose vendor 1001. When we click on transactions, here we see that we've got a $30,000 invoice less our 6000 which brings us to 24000 and a discount of 12245 so the total on this invoice is 23877.55 and again this would be paid through the regular payment journal functionality so in accounts payable under journals payments Payment journal, we can create a new payment journal. And on our lines, here we'll choose our vendor 1001. We'll click Functions, Settlement, and we can see we've got our transaction here that we're going to settle. We've got some discounts that were on this vendor and on this transaction that will be applied as well. So we'll go ahead and mark it and close the form. And it creates a payment for $23,400. And we'd go through the generate payments to create our payment for that, to send to that vendor. And once the payment has been generated, we can go ahead and post this journal. Lesson five is reversing a prepayment. To reverse a payment, we'll go to the Vendor's Invoice tab. There's a prepayment section where we can apply and reverse. In Accounts Payable, if we go to the vendor, we'll choose Vendor 1001. We can click on the Invoice tab here, and notice to the right of the form, we see Apply and Reverse in our prepayment section. If we also double click or choose this vendor, it'll open up this vendor in its own form. And again, on the invoice tab, there's a prepayment section where we can click apply or reverse. Here we can see that we have existing prepayments. This was an invoice for 12,000, the prepayment of 3,600 that was applied. We can select it and by clicking the reverse prepayment application, 
it'll reverse this prepayment off of this invoice. That'll conclude this training on vendor prepayments. In this recording, you will see a new feature that has been included in Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012. It is account payment workflow. Although it has been focused in vendor invoice workflows, it also can be applied to purchase order workflows. It will cover all the possible options you have to manage workflow and also the basic setup of all the available elements. In lesson one, you will see the basic workflow setup and general workflow options. Workflow setup. Invoice workflows, one of the processing steps for vendor invoices. With invoice workflow, you define the approval or view process that invoices have to pass through before being posted. You access to the invoice workflow from the following path. Accounts payable, setup, accounts payable workflows. There are other workflows that affect account payable. For example, purchase order workflows, but they are created from the procurement and sourcing module. Once you access to the account payable workflow pane, you have several options. Let's see these options in AX. This is the Accounts Payable Workflows pane. From here, you can create new workflows. You can edit existing workflows. Whenever you modify a workflow, a new version will be created. You also can delete workflows, but you have to take into account that no instances can be running at that time on that workflow. You can check the different versions of a workflow, select the workflow and click Versions and the workflow versions form appears. Here, there is version with errors. There is another version of that workflow with an info message about that some data is missing, but this data is not needed. And from this form, you can view any of the versions. You can edit them. You can make them active or inactive but you never can make active a version with errors. You also can delete versions, but you have to take into account that no instances can be running on that workflow at, the, at that moment. You can copy versions. When you copy a version, a new workflow will, will be created. No a new version is a new workflow. We can't import versions from Microsoft Dynamics AX 2009 and from Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012. And we also can export versions. Close the form. We can have more than one workflow of the same type as this case. Whenever we have more than one workflow with the same type, we have to decide which of them is the default one. If I want to set one workflow, for example, this one as the default, we have to select the workflow and click on set as default. We also can import workflows from AX 2009 and from AX 2012. But here, it will be a new workflow and not a new version. We also can view the workflows, but from this view, we cannot do any modification. We can refresh this pane whenever we make any change. We can export to Microsoft Excel a list of workflows, and we can attach documents, files, and other kind of attachments. Let's come back to the presentation. When you create a new workflow, a list of all types of account payable workflow is displayed. You have to select the type of workflow you want to create. As you can see, there are several vendor invoice workflows. You have the vendor invoice approval journal workflow, the vendor invoice journal workflow, the vendor invoice register journal workflow, the vendor invoice workflow, and the vendor invoice line workflow. It's this type of workflows apply to a different invoice uh, vendor invoice. In this presentation, you will see only vendor invoice workflow and vendor invoice line workflow because they are the more complex and because they contain all the available elements. Then, if you are able to understand how to create vendor invoice workflow and vendor invoice line workflows, 
you will be able to create any of the other vendor invoice workflows. When creating a new workflow, the workflow form is displayed. This workflow form is composed of the following section, the action pane, where you have the options to modify and to manage the workflow element, the workflow element section, where you have all the available elements that are selected and combined to get expected workflow process, the canvas or workflow area in which we put the elements and we connect them to get expected results, and the action button bar, where we have options to manage the view of the workflow. Here, you can see the action pane, the workflow element section, the canvas or workflow area, and the action button Let's see some of these options in AX. Let's see the workflow form options. Select a workflow and click on edit. If there is an active version, this is the one that will be shown. If there is only one version, this is the one that will be shown. From this form, we can edit the workflow. Let's see the action pane options. Some elements are composed of other elements. For example, proof vendor invoice element is composed of at least one step. If we want to access to the steps, we have to select the element and then click on level now. Now we can see the step. If you want to come back to the main workflow view, you can click on the workflow link or you can click on level up. From the action pane, you also can perform actions such as undo, redo, copy, paste, cut, and delete. You also can perform those actions from the keyboard toolbox. The toolbox is the workflow elements section. If you want to hide the workflow element section, you can click on the toolbox. And if you want to display it, you can click again on the toolbox. Properties. All elements have their own properties, and you have to fill in all the mandatory information of the property. Click the approved vendor invoice element and click on properties. As you can see, the property form has some property groups. These property groups are the same as the options we have at the right side of the action pane. If we select another element that has different property groups, the options of the action pane will change, and there will be the property groups of the selected element. Close the property form. If we select the element, and we click, for example, a notifications icon, the same property form is displayed, but we are positioned on the notification property group directly. European. The European is a new feature that helps to know which errors you have made in the workflow, or which information you haven't filled in and you should fill it. For example, let's click on error pane. Here you can see there is an error. If you click on the message and double click, you will be directly positioned on the property groups of the element that is wrong. In this example, the assignment has not been set up. This element will be assigned to a person that is, for example, the app. Close the property, property form. And the error and warnings form has not any information or error message. Close, close the errors and warning form. Let's come back to the workflow main view. The workflow elements contain all the available elements for this type of workflow. We will drag and drop the elements we need 
to create our workflow to the canvas or workflow area. We have to connect all the elements and always the flow has to start from the start and it has to finish in the end element. We will see all the elements in the next lesson. The action bottom bar helps to, to manage the view of the workflow. We enable the auto connect icon when you select an element, drag and drop to the workflow area of Canvas, and you can see there is a connection suggested. You can accept it or you can remove it. You also can use the zoom in icon to make the workflow, the view of the workflow bigger, or the zoom out icon to make the view of the workflow smaller. If we want to come back to the default view, you can select set zoom. This maximize is very useful, especially for big workflows. When you are working with many elements, sometimes you cannot see all the elements in your screen. Then if you click on maximize, you will see the whole workflow and all the elements in the view. Let's click on zoom in and let's see the overview icon. As you can see, the overview icon shows an overview of the whole workflow and also it shows you how which part of the workflow is displayed in your screen. Then in this way, you have an idea about what which is the view you have uh, considering the whole picture. Let's reset the zoom, close the overview. I'm going to delete this element I created and connect my approved element again to the end element. If I consider my workflow now is right, I can save and close it. I can add notes. Okay, so I can say if I want to activate the new version, I say yes. Okay, now we can go to the versions and we can see that my version is the active one and it has the comment I want. Okay, this is the end of this lesson where we have seen all the options of the workflow form. Uh, you also have seen how to manage workflows in general. In the next lesson, you will see all the elements one by one. Lesson two, workflow elements. In this lesson, you will learn how to use the existing elements to get the expected workflow behavior. As you have seen in lesson one, workflows are composed of workflow elements connected. All the elements have to come from another element and they have to go at least to other elements. There are only two exceptions, the start and the end element. All the workflows have to start from the start element and they have to finish on the end element. It means that there cannot be workflows before the start and there cannot be workflows after the end element. Workflow element properties define how each workflow element has to behave. In the properties, we define things such as the users, roles, or participants that will be assigned to each item task. You also define the text that those users, I mean the approvers or the reviewers or the submitters, will see when they open and invoice the things involved in a, in a workflow. Another important thing is that in the properties, you can define the actions that those users can perform. The information to fill in each property group depends on the element. Each type of element has different property groups and has different properties. Then, depending on the element that we are setting, you will have different properties to set. When you get a new workflow, if you don't have any element selected and you click on the properties, the submission properties form will be shown. The submission is the first step needed to start to run any workflow. The approval element is probably the workflow element most important. It is very similar to the 
workflows we had in AX 2009. The approvals, as you have seen in lesson one, have two levels that have to be set up, the approval and also the steps. The approvals are used to put the invoice to the appropriate person for review and approval. Let's see how to create a new workflow and how to set up its submission property and approval element. And let's see how it works when we post an invoice. Let's create a new vendor invoice workflow from Accounts Payable Workflows pen. Click on New, select the type of workflow you want to create, and then create workflow. The workflow form is you have not selected any, any element, you can click on Properties, and then the submission properties will be shown. In the basic setting property groups, you have the name of the, of the workflow. That is the text that the submitter will see whenever he opens the invoice that is pending of submission. The owner that is responsible of the workflow, you can add email template for workflow notifications and you can add instructions for the submitter. In the activation property group, you can set conditions for running this workflow. Then whenever the condition is met, the workflow will run. But if the condition is not met, the workflow will not run. You can select those events that you want to be notified about here. In the nodes property group, you can add comments that uh, will help you to understand the history of this workflow. Then let's go to basic setting property group and add submission instructions. Please click submit. This is not mandatory, but if you don't fill it, you will get an information informing that is not filled. To create a complex instructions, you can use placeholders. There are not other mandatory fields in this, in this form, then we can close it. Let's add the approved vendor invoice element to the workflow. Then click on it, drag and drop in the area. As you can see, the connection has been suggested. This is because the auto connect icon is enabled. If you want to connect the approved vendor element to the end element now, you can click on maximize, then the whole the whole workflow is, is, is in the view and you can connect them from here or you also can drag the end closer to, to the approved element and then click on zoom in and reset zoom. Now the view is clearer. Select the approved vendor invoice element and drag to the end element. Now they are connected. Let's set up the properties of the approved vendor invoice element. Click on it and then click on properties. In basic setting property groups, you have the name. The name is not going to be shown in AX. In automatic actions, you can enable automatic actions. It means that you can add conditions whenever they are met. You can select if the invoice has to be approved automatically or rejected automatically. In the notifications, in the same way as with the workflow or submit uh, properties, you can select the events that, that you want to be notified about. In the basic setting, settings, you can select a final approver. You can set a time limit for the workflow element. It means that, if, for example, in one day the approver has not taken any action, automatically the invoice can be approved or rejected, depending on what you select. Finally, in these property groups, you also can select which actions are going to be available for the prover. There are not properties mandatory here, then we can close the form. As you will remember, in lesson one, the approved and or invoice element has two levels. If you want to to access to the to the other level, you can click on the approved vendor invoice element and click on level down, and you can double click on it. On it. Then now you can see the step. All approved elements uh, have to have at least one step. Then click on it and click on properties. In the basic settings property group, you have the name that is not going to be shown in AX. The word item subject that is the text that the approver will see when he opens the invoice that has to be approved or rejected. And the work item instructions are the instructions that you can add to help the approver to take an action. They will be shown if the approver clicks on the info icon he has available in the invoice. The assignment 
you have to assign to a user always the, the steps. You can assign it to one user or to several. You can do it based on participants, hierarchies, workflow users, or users. Never can be known. In conditions, you can set this step to be run always, or also you can add conditions. Then if the condition is met, the step will not run the workflow, and if the condition is not met, the step will not be run. Escalation. You can set this task to other users to be able to do it. You have to set up the escalation path. Let's go to basic settings and add the mandatory fields. Then, for example, in work item subject, you can put something like please, view, and take an action. And the instructions, you can say approve. If blah blah blah, react. If blah blah blah, you can use placeholders to create more complex texts. The other mandatory uh, property group is the assignment. Then let's select participant, go to role based. As you can see, the task has changed, and we are going to create a very basic uh, assignment. The type of participant, user group participant, and I have a group of participants that is called approvers, where it includes a user that is called also approver. There are not other mandatory fields now, then I can close the property form. Let's go to the main view of the workflow, and let's see if it has errors. Then click on error pane. There are not errors and warnings, then I can close the pane and save and close the workflow. Let's put a note that help us to identify the version, for example, proven, basic, and OK. Activate any version, and OK. It will take some seconds, and uh, when it's finished, uh, I want to, to select this workflow as the default workflow to do it. You have to select the workflow you have created and then click on set as default. Now it's the default workflow. Let's see how this workflow works when you create an invoice. Then go to account payable and then click on pending vendor invoices. I already have created an invoice. Then this is the invoice I created. The demo 0001 and then you can edit it or you can see the invoice double clicking but we are going to submit directly submit you can add comments no comments and submit now the invoice should be assigned to the approver that is the, the assignment we we set up then let's go to connect to ax as the approver user Go to account payable, common form, vendor invoices, and vendor invoices assigned to me. As you can see, the demo 0001 invoice is assigned. Then you can double click and see the information of the invoice, but let's approve it from here. Actions and approve. Approve. Before approving, the invoice, you cannot post it because the workflow is not completed. Then the system will not allow you to do it. Refresh, and the invoice has disappeared from the vendor invoices assigned to me. Then let's come back to the administration user, refresh, and you can see the demo 0001. From here, post and post. You have been able to post it. Now it will be in open vendor invoices. Let's return to the presentation and see a new workflow element. The tasks are designed to be assigned to a user for non approval actions. For example, you can create an, a workflow where you want the invoices reviewed before it is approved. There are two types of tasks the review vendor invoice with properties uh, will be shown in the demo and the review vendor invoice matching 
The properties of both tasks are very similar, but one of the most interesting exceptions is that in the review vendor invoice matching, you cannot reject invoices. Let's see the task element in a demo. Let's create a new vendor invoice workflow from accounts payable workflows and select a task element for it. Then click on new, select the type of workflow, vendor invoice workflow, and create workflow. Let's set up the properties of the submission, then click on properties and add submission instructions. Click on submit. Close the property form and then add uh, the review vendor invoice to the canvas workflow area. Then select drag and drop. As you can see, no connection has been. Uh, recommended. This is because the auto connect icon is not enabled. Then you have to do it manually. Click on one of the connections of the start element and drag to the review vendor invoice element. Then you can click on maximize and you can see all the elements that are available. Now to see the view bigger, you can reset, for example, and then click. Click on one of the connections of the task and then drag to the end element. Now the task is connected. Click on it and click on properties. Basic settings. Uh, the name of the task is not, is not going to be shown in AX. The work pattern subject is the text that the reviewer will see when he or she opens the, the invoice that is pending of submitting. The work item instructions is a text that you can uh, write in order to help the reviewer to take an action. It, uh, the reviewer can see this information when he clicks on the info icon that will be available in the invoice. It is pending of reviewer. You always have to assign the task to a user, uh, uh, one user or several users. You can do it based on participant, hierarchies, workflow user, user, or Queue. Then, depending on the on what you sell it, you can create more complex or less complex assignments. You also can escalate the the task to other user. You can create automatic actions, create a condition, and depending on the on if the condition is met or not, the uh, invoice can be completed or rejected automatically. You can enable notifications. You can set a time limit in, in advanced settings property group. You can set a time limit for workflow element. That is the same that in the in the approved element. And you can uh, select which actions are going to be allowed for the reviewer. As you can see, this is one of the most interesting difference with the approved element because you cannot approve uh, invoices. Then let's go to the basic settings and add a text. Please review. Here, check payment conditions. Let's go to the assignment and click on user. Go to the user tab and select a user. For example, you can say, select one or several. I'm going to uh, select the reviewer that is a user I created. Now I can close the property forms. Let's see if the workflow has any error. Click on error pen, it has no errors, then I can save and close the workflow. You can add notes to identify the version and okay, activate the new version. Okay. Now I now I want this workflow is the default workflow for vendor invoices because I want to check how it works when creating an invoice. Then let's select the workflow and click on set as default. If you go to uh, account payables and then to the open vendor pending vendor invoices, you will see the demo 002 uh, invoice that is pending of submission. Then click on submit. You can add comments, but I need it. Then submit. The invoice now is assigned to the reviewer. 
following the setup you have done before. Let's connect to AX as the, the viewer. If you go to account payables and then vendor invoices and then vendor invoices assigned to me, you can see that the demo 002 invoice has been assigned to the reviewer. Then click on actions. You can complete, reject or delegate, then click on complete and complete. Refresh, and as you can see, the invoice has disappeared from the vendor invoice uh, assigned to me form. Let's come back to the administrator session and refresh. Now you can select the invoice and post it. Before you will not post it because the workflow was not completed. I'm in the presentation and I'm going to show you another type of workflow, the automated task. The automated tasks are executed without user intervention. They can perform selected validations and also post the vendor invoices without user intervention, which is very important. You only have to set up two property groups, the basic settings that only contain the name and the notifications. You can select which events you want to be notified when they are done. Automated tasks are processes internally created, which behavior cannot be modified, and then it cannot be set up. There are two types of automated tasks, evaluate policy rules for invoices, and also post-vendor invoices. Let's see how they work in AX. Let's see how the post vendor invoice automated tasks work. I'm going to select a previous workflow I created that it has uh, only an approval element. Then select the workflow and click on edit. If you select the approved vendor invoice element and click on level down, click on step one and properties, you can see this step has been assigned to the user approver. Let's go back to the main view of the workflow, clicking on the workflow link, and let's select the post vendor invoices element to the canvas. The purpose of this workflow is that once the invoice has been approved, it has to be posted automatically. Then I'm going to delete this connection because the flow is that the invoice, it has to be firstly approved and then posted. Then I have to connect the approved with the post element and the post element with the end element. Let's see if it has errors, there are not errors, then save and close. You can add version nodes, okay, and activate a version. Activate, okay. This workflow is the default workflow, then let's see how it works when we create a new invoice. Then go to account payable, vendor invoices, and pending vendor invoices. Here you have the post them three uh, invoice that has one line. Submit and submit, and the invoice should be assigned to the approver. Let's open the session as approver. Press. I'm in account payable, common vendor invoices, vendor invoices assigned to me. Here is the invoice. Then click on action and then approve. Close the approve session and refresh the pending vendor invoices. This is an account payable, common vendor invoices, pending vendor invoices for Refresh. As you have seen, the DEM zero, the most DEM zero three invoice has disappeared. Go to open vendor invoices where the uh, vendor invoices that have been posted but they are not paid are listed. Then let's go here and look for the invoice. For example, post. Here you can see that the invoice has been posted automatically. Come back to the presentation and see a new type of workflow element, that is the flow controls. Uh, the flow controls routes the workflow considering a decision that they can be manual or they can be automatic. Also, it helps 
to create workflows that are going to run in parallel and also it connects the workflow to other workflows. Then there are four types of follow controls depending on the purpose of them. Then you have conditional decisions, manual decisions, parallel activity and some workflow. The conditional decisions are automatic, then you only have to add a condition and depending if the condition is met or is not met, the workflow will, will decide the next step. There is only one property group for this element and let's see how it works in AX. Let's see how the conditional decisions element works. Then I already have uh, modified the last rendering with workflow I created. Then click on the workflow, click on versions, and let's select the last version that I already modified. Click on edit, and then the modified version will appear. As you can see, it has errors, but it, because it is not completed. Then the purpose of the new workflow is that if the invoice amount is higher than $10,000, then the invoice has to be approved by the approver. But the, if the invoice is uh, lower than $10,000, then it's enough if the invoice is reviewed by the reviewer. Then the first thing is that a conditional decision has to be checked. Then select the conditional decision element, drag and drop into the workflow area. Let's set up its conditions. Click on it and right click on properties. The, there, are all, there is only one property group that is basic settings and you have to add a condition. Then add a condition and look for the invoice amount. Invoice amount is here. Then the condition is the invoice amount is higher than 10,000 USD. Okay. Now you can close the property form and connect the conditional decision accordingly what you want. It means the first thing is to check the condition. If the condition is true, it means that the invoice amount is higher than $10,000, then it has to be approved. And if the invoice amount is lower than $10,000, then the invoice is enough if it is reviewed. The approve and the review are already set up and the assigned user is the approver for the approval element and the reviewer for the review element. Then now check if it has errors, there are not errors, then you can save and close. Add notes, conditional decision. Okay. And activate it. Let's make the last version active. Okay, now it's active. Okay. The pane is refreshed and the default render inbox is the, uh, the one we already have created. Then let's go to account payable. And pending vendor invoices. Here, the demo 003 can be submitted. Submitted. Cancel. Let's say the amount. The amount is 3,600. 3, then it's lower than $10,000. Then submit and submit. If the amount is lower than 10,000, the invoice has to be assigned to the reviewer because it's enough if the review is done. Then let's open a session for the reviewer. Go to account payable, vendor invoices, common vendor invoices, and vendor invoices assigned to me. The invoice is here. Now you have to complete it because this is a task and not an approved element. 
that is that is running at this moment. Then complete. The image cannot be posted until the workflow is completed. Then refresh, close the reviewer session, refresh the administrator session, and now you can post the demo 033 invoice and it's, and it's posted. The presentation and another flow control is the manual decision. The decision maker decides which way to follow. Then this is not uh, automatic as it was in the conditional decisions. Let's see how it works in the AX. Come back to the presentation and let's see another flow control. The parallel activity allows that two or more workflows run at the same time. You have to specify at least two branches and each branch will be a different workflow. In the same way as the approval element, it has more than one level. The parallel activities will be shown in the demo. Let's see how manual decisions work. The best way is to select the previous workflow I did for conditional decisions and edit. The workflow that will be shown is that one because it's the active version. Select the conditional decision and delete it. Now you can select the manual decision, drag and drop into the workflow area. Let's set up the properties of the manual decision. Click on properties. Here you can see that the basic settings uh, where is included the name of the element that is not going to be shown in AX, the instructions that is the work item subject, the text that the the decision maker will see when he or she opens the invoice, the work item instructions that are the instructions that the decision maker will see if he clicks on the info icon of the, uh, of the invoices. The outcomes are the options that the decision maker will have. He has to choose between both. You can enable notifications. You have to assign the task to someone, to one user or several users. You can escalate this task to other use to other user, and you also can set a time limit for the workflow element. You go to basic settings and fill in the mandatory fields. The work at uh, item subject please decide. The work item instructions please decide if approve or review. And the outcomes can be proof. The invoice review the invoice. Let's go to the assignment. It is also mandatory. And select user, for example, user tab, reviewer, select it. Close the property form. And now connect the start element to the manual decision because it's the first thing that uh, has to happen to continue with the workflow, then if the option one is selected, the invoice has to be approved. If the option two is selected, then the invoice has to be reviewed. Let's save and close the, the version. Okay, let's make it active. When it finishes, let's see how it works when treating an invoice. Go to account payables, pending vendor invoices, and here you are the demo 0004. The amount is not important, then you can submit it directly and submit. The reviewer is the, per not the person that is assigned to the decision. The, to the decision. Let's go to the reviewer decision, press, and now you can see the demo 0004 invoice that is assigned to him. You can get this form going to account payable, common vendor invoices, vendor invoices assigned to me.
go to actions and you can see the two outcomes we set up approve the invoice or review the invoice i want it to be approved approve the invoice and approve the invoice and for us the invoice has disappeared it has to be assigned to the approver then let's go to access to ax as approvers this is the approval session and if you go to account payables common vendor invoices vendor invoices assigned to me you can say that the invoice is here the demo 0004 then go to actions and you can see the, that the art actions uh, typical of the element proof element are available then let's approve it proof and approve we can leave this session then let's go to the administrator, the admin session, and refresh. Now, the workflow is completed and you can post it. Go to the presentation and let's see the last flow control, that is the workflow. So workflow allows to run more than one workflow together, one after another. The condition is that both workflows, workflow and workflow, they need to have at least one field in common let's say its properties in ax the expense of workflows the best is firstly to have a look to the workflow that is going to be this workflow in the workflow we will create later then that workflow is going to be a purchase order workflow purchase order workflows are created from procurement and sourcing module set up procurement and sourcing workflows we will select the 46 then click on edit you also can click on view workflow, but clicking on edit, you can see the elements that are available for purchase order workflows that are very similar to the elements you have available in rendering workflows. This is a very basic workflow that only has one task. Select the task and click on properties. The work item subject and work item instruction has been filled in. Go to assignment, and you can see that it has been assigned to a user who is the reviewer. Let's close the property form and let's close the purchase order workflow form. Go to account payable, set up, and account payable workflow. Let's create a new one, click on new, select the type of workflow that we want to create, and click on create workflow. Set up the Submission properties, go to properties, click submit, close the property form. The workflow I will create has a purpose that when you submit the vendor invoice, it cannot be posted till the purchase order that is associated is, uh, is reviewed. Then let's select the workflow element, drag and drop to the canvas workflow area, and let's connect the start element and the end element to this workflow. Then drag the end element closer to this workflow and connect them. Click on workflow and click on properties. This is very easy as you only have to select the workflow, the 46, this workflow that is the 46, and you have it's mandatory that you select the field. In this case, PortD, that is the field that has in common the purchase order and the invoice. You can wait for the workflow to complete before continuing, but you cannot wait uh, to this workflow is completed. Then let's select the first one because it makes sense that you don't want to post the invoice till the purchase order associated is, uh, is reviewed. Close the property form. Let's see if it has errors. Click on error pen. There are not errors. Close the error form pen and save and close. So workflow. Okay, and activate this version. When the version is activated, I'm going to select this workflow as a default workflow. Select the workflow and click on set as default. Let's see how it works when you create a purchase order. 
then go to a table, purchase orders and all purchase orders. New purchase order, select the vendor, Swift 004, yes, okay. And the lines, item number 1000, price 10, save the invoice, the purchase order, go to the invoice tab and click on invoice. The default quantity for lines is under quantity and select a number. And for example, then 00007 and submit. The purchase order will be assigned to the reviewer, uh, the reviewer user. Then let's enter to the to AX as the reviewer. Go to account payable, purchase order, and purchase order assigned to me. Refresh the view and the new purchase order appears. Submit it the new workflow. The workflow. Submit. And now the, the reviewer has to review the purchase order, then review and decide. In this case is going to be completed. Refresh and you can see that the purchase order has disappeared from the purchase order assigned to me uh, form. Let's close. Review your session, close the vendor invoice, and the purchase order, refresh the view. We are in account payable, promo, purchase order, or purchase order. Refresh the view because it was not refreshed with the uh, new purchase order. Go to purchase and confirm the purchase order. Okay, now you can go to account payable, vendor invoices, and pending vendor invoices. And here you will have the invoice them 0007. If you go to actions and view history, you can see that the workflow has been completed. Close the form and now you can post the invoice. It has been posted. Come back to the presentation and let's see the last workflow element that is line item workflow. Line item workflow element allows Connect vendor invoice workflows with line invoice workflows. This is very useful, especially for those invoices that is not enough if they are approved or reviewed on in general, but they have to be approved or reviewed line by line. This element is only available in vendor invoice workflows and in purchase order workflows. It is very flexible as you can invoke one line invoice workflow for all the lines or different line invoice workflow for each line. Of course, previously you have to create a line invoice workflow to select it as workflow. Let's say its properties in AX. Let's create a new vendor invoice workflow that contains a line item workflow element. And the purpose of the new workflow will be that whenever an invoice is created, it cannot be posted till all the lines one by one are approved. Then firstly, you have to create a vendor invoice line workflow. Then click on new, select that type of workflow and create workflow. It's not needed to create the submission properties because they will be taken from the main workflow. Select the approved vendor invoice line workflow and connect it with the start element and with the end element that you previously have seen. Let's set up the approved vendor invoice land element properties, then click on properties. Here, there is nothing that is mandatory. You can leave it as default. Then go one level down, select the step, click on properties, and enter the work item subject. For example, please approve the land. On instructions, approve if something, react if something. Assign the task to a user that is going to be the reviewer. Select it, close the property form, go to the main workflow view and click on 
error pane to check if there are errors. The submission instructions have not been filled in, but they are not needed. As I already said, then close this for and click on save and close. You can add notes. Okay. Activate this version. Okay. And now let's create the main workflow that will contain this uh, vendor invoice line workflow. So click on new again, select the vendor invoice workflow, create workflow. Now you should submit instructions for the submitter. Click on submit, for example, and close the property forms. Let's select the vendor invoice line, that is the line item workflow element, drag to the canvas and communicate with the connected with the start element. Put the end element closer to the proof, reset view, and connect the vendor invoice line element with the end element. Let's set up the vendor invoice line element. Click on properties. You can define that you want to wait for all line item workflows to complete. This option is available in vendor invoice workflows, but it's not in purchase order uh, workflows. Then say yes. And you can invoke a single uh, workflow for all the, la of all the line items or invoke a workflow for each line item. If you select the second options, you have to add conditions in order to decide when one workflow has to be assigned to one line or to another. Let's select the first one because I only have created one vendor invoice line workflow. Then select it, close the properties. Check if it has errors, clicking on error pane, there are not errors, then you can save and close the workflow. Vendor invoice line, okay. Activate, and when it is activated, I will set this workflow as the default workflow. Select the workflow and click on set as default. Let's see how it works. Go to account payable, vendor invoices, and pending vendor invoices. Here you are the DEM08 uh, invoice that has two lines. Click on submit and submit. The approved element was uh, assigned to the reviewer user. Then let's open AS as the reviewer. Go to account payable, vendor invoices, and um, vendor invoices assign it to me. Refresh the view, wait some seconds, and here is the, is the invoice. As you can see, the workflow text is not here. This is because you have to open the invoice and now select a line. Now the text and the workflow has been activated. Select one line and approve it. The workflow text has disappeared. Then select the second line and it appears again. Click on approve and approve. Close the vendor invoice form, refresh the view, and the invoice has disappeared. Let's close the reviewer session and let's go to vendor, vendor invoices. Refresh. And here you are the DEM08 invoice. Go to Actions, View History, Tracking Details, the workflow has been completed. It means you can post it. Post and post. Okay. In this lesson, you have seen all the available invoice workflow elements. You have learned how to set up them and how they behave when you create a new vendor invoice. Finally, I just want to let you know that you can combine all those elements, creating very complex workflows to get expected results. As a tip, I want to remind you that in the same way as in Microsoft Dynamics AX 2009, for demo purposes, you have to run the tutorial workflow for processor. To do it, you have to go 
to the development client, go to AOT and then forms and look for the tutorial workflow processor. Open and start. The partner services offering is provided to members in the Microsoft Partner Network to ensure success throughout the business cycle. When you enroll, re-enroll, or qualify for an upgrade, you will receive advisory hours allocated to your organization based on membership competency level. With the new Microsoft Dynamics Partner Services plans available July 1, 2011, partners enrolling in the Advantage Plus plan will receive an additional 30 advisory hours. Advantage plan subscribers will receive an additional 15 advisory hours. Advisory hours provide a single currency to use towards technical enablement, and technical pre-sales and advisory services. For more information regarding what you can use advisory hours for, go to https colon forward slash forward slash partner dot microsoft dot com, click the support tab, and then click technical pre-sales and advisory services. If you have additional questions, contact askpts at microsoft dot com or call 1-800-MPN-SOLVE.